I'm not writing with a set of answers. I'm not writing with a set of, here's what you should do with your life. The book is really written as like, let's look at these complicated problems together for a long time and just sit with it and see what happens, you know? Gia Tolentino, first of all, congratulations for somebody so young. You're already showing a lot of promise in the field of journalism and also your book hitting number two on the New York uh, Times bestseller list. Congratulations on everything. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. It's really exciting. Let's start with the first question. Can you take us through your writing journey? Have you always known growing up that you wanted to write? Yeah, I think it's always been the only thing that I was good at. I, I can't even remember the first thing that I wrote. It was just, you know, as soon as I could read, I had my head in a book. I would read while I was roller skating around the neighborhood. I would read in the bathtub at the dinner table. You know, I was that kind of kid. And I was always writing, you know, I would keep a journal. I would write stories about girls who opened a door in the closet and ended up in a new world. You know, like it was just all the time. I constantly read and wrote almost compulsively. And I kept doing that through school. It was, you know, again, the only thing I was really good at. And I found myself just writing all the time, but I didn't think of it as a possible career because, you know, I didn't grow up knowing anybody that was a writer. It seemed, it seemed like not a real thing that was possible to do. I kind of happily assumed I'd be an English teacher because I had seen English teachers and I loved them and I thought maybe I could be good at that. It was so it was sort of circuitous. I, after college, I graduated in 2009, which was not a time in which many people were getting excellent jobs. Um, so I joined the Peace Corps and I taught English in Kyrgyzstan for a year and I kept writing. I moved back to Houston where my family's from, you know, was writing ad copy and corporate newsletters and any job I could find on Craigslist that would let me write. And just somehow I started writing for the internet, writing mostly unpaid for blogs and which led to my first job which I took while I was in grad school for fiction writing and just was like, I'll see how long I can do this. And I'm still doing it. <laughs> yes, and you seem very happy uh, doing it. Tell us about this job with The New Yorker. I mean, it, it's a big deal, right? Um, how, how did you get it? What was your initial reaction? What was the first piece you wrote for them? I don't remember the first piece I wrote for them. It probably wasn't good. <laughs> I, um, I, was, I was astounded. This was, I, I got hired there in 2016. I'd been editing a feminist blog called Jezebel uh, before that. And I'd been writing things that were often quite vulgar, like often very, you know, informal, like not, you know, the New Yorker is this sort of juggernaut of an institution writing, you know, putting out this like serious magazine every week. And I was blogging about, you know, music videos and memes and stuff. I was like, they couldn't possibly want me to work for them. and. But, you know, when the opportunity presented itself, it was the chance to get something that I think many writers and journalists my age, it's hard to come by, which is some time, time to take a little bit longer with things and time to be edited really, really thoroughly and carefully and to be able to spend months reporting something, you know, if you want to, which is, is a privilege and to be fact checked to death, you know, it was a delight. And you're getting all of the training, right? And I'm sure that you already knew a lot going into the job and now you even know more. If there's one oh, yeah. thing, Yes. Oh, I mean, I didn't know anything. I think, <laughs> I think, I mean, it was such a, it was a real privilege to be able to learn on the job in, in such good hands. I mean, I, I think that's, that's the thing that I like about writing in general and about any sort of opportunity that's ever presented itself to me in my life, which is that, you know, I, you start off knowing nothing and with journalism, right, you ask people enough questions and then you suddenly you learn, right? And it's, it's like, that's the magic thing about writing. You can start off with a question and you just keep reading, keep asking questions and you'll figure out how to answer it. I still find that process really thrilling and magical. And um, it, was, it was a real stroke of luck to get to do that under the editors of The New Yorker. Could you talk about, let's say, uh, the one thing that you pr probably would not have learned had you not gotten this uh, opportunity with The New Yorker? 
So the New Yorkers fact checkers are sort of legendarily intense. Like if you describe that the sky is blue on a day that you're having a conversation with somebody, they'll look up the weather and say like, actually it was cloudy at 11 a.m. on this day, you know? I mean, I'm exaggerating slightly, but it's that close. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I pride myself on being a meticulous note taker on being as careful as I can be when I write things, but getting fact check at the New Yorker was a real, you know, a, an incredibly embarrassing but productive education in how bad our memories can be. You know, sometimes I, like it, it, it was this real education in humility in learning, you know, you need a fact checker to watch, you know, to, to be at your back at every second, or you, you know, you might, you, you, your memory just might be wrong. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it was a good education in that. I love that. But you know, you write about um, entertainment, socially relevant issues, you, you, you write about different issues, right? Um, is there one particular topic that speaks to you that you love writing about? Right now, I'm not sure what I love writing about because I've taken a little bit of a break from work a little bit because I had a pandemic baby. Um, uh, but congratulations. <laughs> thank you. She <laughs> has my last name. She has a Filipino last name, which I'm very proud of. Uh -huh. um, How old is I, she? Sorry. <laughs> she's she's eight months old. And I love babies. Oh my gosh, eight months. Oh it's my the gosh. best. She's she's smiling and giggling, but she can't move, you know, so it's perfect. <laughs> Yes, and sleeping? she's a great sleeper. Like she's yeah. super fat, loves to eat. So she slept through the night really early because she was full, which oh, is right. iconic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, so, you know, and you know, the pandemic has upended so much about, mm -hmm. you know, like kind of all, the only thing that I've really been interested in this entire year was the protests and mutual aid networks. And, you know, this sort of, um, I, I used to write though, I possibly exhausted this topic and it, it pops up in my book a lot, but over and over, I was really drawn to, I mean, I'm a, I'm a creature of the internet. I mm -hmm. created my first little web page when I was like 10, you know, I've been writing on the internet. I've been, you know, formed by social media and all of these things. And I would find myself writing over and over about the sort of economic systems that underpin the internet, the sort of structures of surveillance capitalism and mm -hmm. commodified selfhood that make up the social internet and sort of the effects that these economic structures have on, you know, our normal emotional desires and on everyday life. Um, but I think I was always so interested in the internet because it was easy to be, because real life was more fun than the internet. It was always you know, the, the internet was this kind of thing to look at. But then during the pandemic, the internet became the entire world mm -hmm. and real life became, you know, this very constrained thing. And I stopped, I stopped being able to write about the internet in a lot of ways. How has COVID affected you and your career? As someone who is conscious on an everyday basis of her luck, you know, COVID I feel has intensified that for, you know, for those of us who are lucky enough to be able to work at home, right? I mean, so many people, like my mom has been going to her job at a medical clinic every day, you know, like, like, you know, so many of my cousins are nurses, right? Like, like there are, I've been really aware of this luxury that I have been able to safely work at home this entire time. Mm -hmm. And the last year has been mystifying and bewildering and scary and, strange in so many ways that it has shaken up my interests, my preconceptions, my priorities, you know, in un uncountable ways. But in terms of my actual work life, I'm just here sitting at my computer typing like I always do, you know, like, like this, this, this coddled job that I have where I just sit and type, like it's unchanged basically. <laughs> Right. And, 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 and also motherhood, motherhood will change you. I'll talk about that in a yes. little bit. <laughs> also, I want to, I want to ask you about, because you mentioned that the protests last year, it was Black Lives Matter. And just recently we saw, or we're hearing the news about another guy, another black guy. Right. Um, but before that, um, just a few weeks ago or a month ago, there was a wave of anti-Asian hate crimes. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on those and what, what are the chances that we'll be seeing your writing on those anytime soon. I have not written about this horrific wave of anti-Asian violence, partly because I feel a little bit paralyzed by heartbreak, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, you know, the, the video of the Filipino woman in Midtown Manhattan, I mean, it's, 
it's, it's devastating. And it's also really complicated to talk about because unlike with, you know, Dante West or George Floyd, right? Those were murders committed by the state. Mm -hmm. You know, these are not, this is not state violence. It's individual violence, which doesn't make it better, but it's, it's a different type of mm -hmm. thing, you know, you can't make the exact analogy. And also the question of, um, you know, whenever you start talking about Asian American experience or identity, it's very complex, right? Because this is a coalition with, you know, with the, the greatest income disparity within the category of any racial category in the States. There's almost no comparing the experience of, let's say like a working class Vietnamese woman in a massage parlor to, you know, a, an upper class sort of like East Asian doctor or lawyer, right? And so it is, it's so confoundingly complicated to speak of an Asian American response, you know, a broad community, you know, this is, we are as a group, split politically, incredibly diverse demographically and, you know, economically. And the task of doing justice to the tragedy and the fear, while also recognizing that complexity, has felt daunting, you know, overwhelming. Overwhelming, right. And um, it's going to be been a heartbreaking time. I mean, it's it's devastating. And what I will say is that I think you know, around Atlanta, around these like horrific, around Angelo Quinto, you know, all of these things, all of these stories, I think one overdue thing is happening, which is that many other people in America, many white people specifically are recognizing that there is an entrenched history of Asian exclusion and anti-Asian violence at the hands of the state often, even though these incidents have not necessarily been. And to recognize that as a fundamental part of, our, of America's history is essential. And I'm glad that that has been getting space. I like that. Recognition is the first step, right? Re yeah. Recognizing that there's a problem, recognizing that there's, there has, uh, we have to do something about it. Right. Yeah, and I think, you know, if there is any general thing about the Asian American experience, it may be that of invisibility, right? That, um, that struggles are, are, are washed over as our triumphs. And, and I think that the conversation of the last few months, there is a real sense that something is changing, that, that a new generation maybe of Asian American sort of progressive activists is really developing, building power in communities. And that is really exciting for me. Right. And speaking of that, being Filipino, you were raised uh, in Houston. You are born raised in Toronto. Um, to Filipino parents. I have two questions. When you were, uh, when you were talking about your uh, writing journey, how supportive or hesitant were your parents? Oh, they were so supportive. I mean, I think, I think that I've been very similar temperamentally for a long time. Like I have been, I think I was an extremely independent child, very strong-willed, you know, very assertive. And I think, you know, they, they were never, they had, I think, high expectations for me, but they, they gave me a lot of space to figure out what I wanted. Um, and so, and, you know, I, I left, I went to college when I was 16. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I was, I've been, I've lived across the country for them for, you know, half my life at this point. And they, like, and this is a matter of some sorrow to me now that I have a child and, you know, wish that they could be closer to this baby, you know, I've had a very independent, a max, almost maximally independent relationship from them for a long time. Like there was kind of, I was going to do my thing and that was going to be that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Are you scared or excited that your daughter is going to be the same way with you, the way you were toward your parents? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was just speaking with a Filipino book club um, the, the other weekend, a, a Houston Filipino book club, which was, you know, so delightful. And they, one of them asked me this question, because, you know, in my book, I write about doing recreational drugs. Like I wrote about, I write about the experience of sort of seeking the sort of ecstatic feeling that I found in church when I was little, in these like clubs when I was a teenager and, you know, on dance floors and in these sort of murkier experiences. And they were like, are you worried that your daughter is gonna, you know, party a lot? And I was like, she is gonna party a lot. <laughs> like, like she is my child. She is the child of my, my boyfriend is like me also, you know? And 
I, I hope she does. It's, it's interesting. You know, I'm only eight months in to being a parent. It's hard to even consider myself that way too, because it's an experience I've had almost completely in private. You know, I haven't been out in the world with this baby, but when people have children, so much of the conversation is about setting them up for individual sort of protection and success, right? Mm -hmm. And that of course is the, is the classic, the first generation's dream for the second generation, right? Protection and success. And it's interesting to see the way, and I've talked it through with my parents too, the way that for me, like what I want for her is a different world, right? And my hopes for her are almost non-individual. It's like, whatever she's gonna do, she's gonna do, you know, I have no control over it, but I want the world so desperately to be fairer and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and softer and, and better <laughs> and more kinder. equal, kinder, kinder, yeah. Kinder, more, more em empathic. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a mom too. I, I have how, a, how, how many kids? Now? I have a five-year-old daughter and a oh. two-year-old son. Oh, the best! I can totally relate um, to what you're going through. Yeah. Um, they they even say that when you look into the eyes of people, you'll know who are moms because oh, that's interesting. Look about us, they say. Uh -huh. But and, and this leads me to my question with you: Has being a mom has motherhood changed the way you write? and your perspective and the way you look at things? Well, I haven't been doing too much writing because of that baby. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe those, this will be the second book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but I, I think that um, it, has, it has not fundamentally changed me or anything that I think about the world, but it has truly, I think, you know, all throughout, especially the early months when things are tough, right? When you are at your wits end and you are exhausted and you, you feel like, will I ever feel competent or peaceful again, <laughs> you know? And I <laughs> never, think, let me just tell you, never. I know, probably never, but. <laughs> but always worry. Anyway, go ahead. But those first few months are really intense, right? Like it, it does kind of, you kind of regain a sense of equilibrium a little bit. But I think for me, it, the things that I, the things that I would always think about, which is the, you know, economic inequality in this country and, you know, how we ask people to support families on minimum wage that uh, nobody could live on, you know, these things, I thought about them a lot and they were present on my mind, especially during COVID, you know, with everything that was happening with, you know, hunger and lines at food banks and, and essential workers getting so mistreated. Having a kid made that much more intimate for me, thinking about, you know, that we ask parents and mothers specifically to do this, you know, with so many people not making a living wage, so many people worried about how to buy the next thing of diapers or formula, you know, having to go right back to work with no time off, right, and no sort of paid no time, time off. Or no childcare, no, no federally subsidized childcare, no, you know, none of these things. And in that way, I wouldn't say that parenthood has been radicalizing because I have wanted all the, you know, these are the, this was my politics, you know, pre-parenthood, but it's made it a lot more intimate that it's like, you know, how dare we ask people to, to, to care for, care for children in a country with no safety net and, mm -hmm. you know, vast inequality and vast disparities in every way. And it has made me think about how I can reorient my life around these priorities, around ameliorating this in some more direct way. I, lo I love that. Um, and so when you have done that, we would love, love, love to have you back on the show. Whenever I write my book on motherhood. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, uh, it's, it's, it's such a delight talking to you. We've skipped a few questions. I'm looking at it. No, the, the, your book, okay, your first book, that's been such a huge hit. Did you expect that it was going to be received? Like no, I didn't expect <laughs> anyone to read it at all. <laughs> what do you think um, connected with the people? If I were to venture a guess, I mean, I have no idea. And I... I, you know, I, I really don't know. I was, I was shocked. It has been incredibly meaningful and surprising and reassuring that this one specific aspect of it, the fact that I go on book tour and there'd be in a room full of people and there would be this sort of collective admission, certainly on my part, but on everyone there 
it's part two, that we're all worried about the same things, you know, like we, all the things that keep us up late at night, you know, we're worrying about, and it's, it's so intense, I feel for, especially for people. And even as it's been published in countries, in other countries around the world, that, you know, people are worried about, we're all thinking about this sort of terminal stage of capitalism and what the internet is doing to politics. And we're worried about, about, about how to live in a world mm -hmm. that is structured with such, like often such monstrous incentives. And, um, and I think maybe one of the things, like I am a deeply imperfect and ordinary person. And I tried to make that extremely clear in my work, you know, that I, I'm not writing with a set of answers. I'm not writing with a set of, here's what you should do with your life. The book is really written as like, let's look at these complicated problems together for a long time and just sit with it mm -hmm. and see what happens, you know? And what was your, what was the impetus for you writing or coming out with that book? Did you decide first to write a collection of essays or were these essays that you wrote and then decided to collect in a book? I wrote them all for the book. It was really, there were, there were, there was a set of questions sort of in the back of my mind that I'd always thought, you know, if I ever get the time, I could write like 10,000 words about this, you know, but I, I wanted it to be like things that I didn't want people to be reading on their phone, scrolling a website, like something that would really require an like a full immersion of your intention in a book. And then eventually right. enough of these questions just built up and I was like, maybe I should just write a book and see. Does being Filipino contribute to your writing? And in what way or how? So one of the secret goals that I had for my book was that it was, it was a book that it was, it, it was, marketed and received as sort of a mainstream book about culture mm -hmm. but you know it is fully grounded in the point of view of a filipino woman right like a, a it, it is and i think it was important to me that i could write a book that was mostly about women but have it be read as just a book about culture that i could write a book from a non-white you know from a from a minority American's perspective and have that be like exactly, to have that be a, a completely normal thing for someone to be right in the center of the conversation, but not be a white man, right? And, um, and I think specifically though, it's specifically being Filipino has, this, this is something that I wrote about in a review of Kathy Park Hong's Minor Feelings, which is, have you, which is one of the best books about Asian identity. You, you I'm know. starting it now. I'm starting it now because somebody um, also mentioned that to us um, during our event. It's so, so good. And she writes about this, the complex identity position of any kind of Asian American group. And Filipinos have such a specific, you know, legacy of, you know, Americanization and colonization. Uh, and all, yes. all of these things. But for me, growing up Filipino in a mostly white in an almost entirely white community in my school, this private school in Houston that I was on scholarship to, it, um, it was a real education in how a structure of power, in this case, American racism, would both, could both benefit you and punish you at the same time. Like there's a, Kathy writes about this so beautifully in her book that, you know, the, the sort of mainstream American approval Yes. of Asians can often be used as sort of a shield against anti-Black racism. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, Asian Americans and Filipino Americans face enormous amounts of specific, you know, the, the like Filipino nurses have had such a, a high like COVID rate and COVID fatality rate. And there's all these specific things, but, but that experience as a kid growing up, realizing that, that any structure of power, and, and this has became the way that I look at capitalism, the way I look at structures of male power, mm -hmm. it could benefit you and punish, and punish you at the same time. And that was a really early education in complexity, I think. Can we, can we interact with structures of power in a way that 
doesn't serve them, but subverts them. Right. And that is a, that's a mission that I think I've failed at often in my life. It's a, I think I have often worked within structures of power in a way that has ultimately served them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in this, and I'm, I speak about racism, I speak about capitalism, I speak about patriarchy. Like, I think I have, and, and the question for me now is how do you manipulate or navigate life within these structures in a way that mm-hmm actively breaks them down, right? And I think that one thing can look a lot like the other. I think it can be quite confusing, but I mean, this has been the thing I've been thinking about since last May, right? It's like, how do we really turn our work to something radical and generative and subversive rather than making a bad system a little bit better, right? Right, right. Um, Your thoughts on social media? Um, Well, I, I got, I got off Twitter right before I had my baby because I didn't want to be up all night nursing her and just scrolling through the news, you know? Right. Um, I think, you know, I, I've gotten a lot of pleasure from social media. I wouldn't have a career if not for the sort of democratizing effects that social media has had. I think many writers of color have had the same experience where, you know, we don't have the connections or the, you know, the access that other people did, but we had, we were good on Twitter and somebody noticed us, right? right, right. And so I owe my whole career to these, again, to these structures that I think are deeply damaging. <laughs> um, I think but, you know, but see, that's why, like, you're able to use it to your advantage. I, to me, I think that it's not, it's not fully evil if we just yeah. know how to use it, right? Yeah, but right, and and but there's always the question of you know the longer you on it, who are you serving, right? Are you is, is it is it benefiting? Who is it benefiting? I think it's like this is a question that I I'm trying to ask myself more actively and be more a, a little more critical of my own actions. But I think you know I mean the real thing that I think about social media is that as we've seen this past year, it is. Ultimately, the economic model is based on us being surveilled when we're not, when we have not consented to it, exactly. and us being surveilled when we have. It's a model of surveillance and the commodification of our attention, of our selfhood. And I think where I land is that, you know, the, the ultimate outcome of that is these platforms that only make money through compulsive use and you only get compulsive use through like self-righteousness, through anger, through conspiracy, you know, um, I think we've seen that the, you know, the internet is mainly leading to disinformation, conspiracy, you know, all of these things. It's changed our society so much. Well, yeah, and you think about like the Philippines, the effect that social media has had on politics there, like it's, you know, we're seeing countries all across the globe sort of have these basic civic, you know, mm-hmm. structure is be just decimated by Facebook and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, at the same time, like, yeah, I, I struggle with thinking, you know, they, 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 these platforms appear to be here to stay. So it's sort of like, maybe we just have to try to be human on them. And that's all, that's all that we have. Um, right. They're here to stay. And it's probably going to evolve into something even more, I think, because these, I think the capitalists, the entrepreneurs, they're all just thinking of ways to make a profit, right? Right, and then the only way to make a profit is make us use them more. And like, we all know how it feels. The more we use these platforms, the worse we feel, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I just have been thinking about it as like, you know, we've seen the ultimate outcome of when our natural world is mm-hmm. used as a resource for capitalism, right? Like the natural world is eventually destroyed. Mm -hmm. And when you think about like the raw material for the internet is ourselves, it's our lives, it's our, it's our relationships, it's our emotions. Mm -hmm. And when you think about if, if capitalism's effect on the natural world, the equivalent happens on the last thing we have, you know, it, it's, it's scary. And so it's something that I, I've been trying to think about. What does that mean for like my daily actions? What does that mean for, uh, you know, how I interact with the internet? You know, I mean, that's one of the reasons I wrote about it in the first essay in my book because the internet, it's the central nervous system of contemporary life. There's no bypassing it, right. but 
it, there is, I, I do feel that there's this growing consensus that the way we live with it is mostly bad, you know, like, but like it could be better. Yes. <laughs> That's why some people are saying there might be a correction anytime soon. We don't know. It's just, yeah. like, but I think we're being, um, we got groomed to actually have it as a part of our daily life, like food, like clothing. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. because you know, so many people. I'm guilty of this. First thing you do when you wake up, what you check your phone. Yeah, you check, yeah. <laughs> you mindlessly like your phone clicks to Instagram to be like, "Ooh, is this famous Pomeranian in Japan that I love? Like, has he posted anything new?" Like, <laughs> right. You know. Um, it's yeah, I think, and also we have to we have to give ourselves a little bit of grace and understanding that these plant, you know, these companies they employ hundreds of the the country, the world's best psychologists and data scientists to make us do this you know it's like we're not doing this just because we're you know oh, like we're being weak. manipulated <laughs> yeah like we're being like manipulated by the some of the smartest people in the world but i think um it has been like it has been good for me personally to just constantly ask myself why am i doing what am i doing with my phone do i feel good about it do i think i can change it and, can, and like, maybe I should do that now. Like it's been helpful for me to just kind of continually check myself. Although, you know, I get the sense that like, if I resist or I unplug for two, three days and then you log in and you've missed so much already and you're behind. And you said that in our line of work, we can't be behind. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know it's actually like, where, how do we get around that? <laughs> like, What's next for you? What's on the horizon? I have been, I, I just finished my first screenplay, which has been, oh, which has been it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, yeah, it turns out like that's the kind of work that you can do with a baby because you don't have to call anybody. You don't have to, you know, when you're reporting, you have to get people on the phone on zoom and you know, you schedule have to interview, right. interview people with a baby is like, you know, I can put her to bed and sort of work late at night on this thing. Um, so I just wrote my first screenplay. It's been really fun. And I'm working on some stuff for The New Yorker, slowly easing back, but um, who knows, you know? <laughs> this has been so delightful. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, it's been so nice to talk to you. <laughs> More power to you.